There are some very important aspects of Stonehenge and its landscape that have been unrecognized because the archaeologists are too keyed in on the finer points of archaeology, which is what they do. That is fine. I do not have a problem with that. But they're missing the big picture, as, as you are about to see. So I, I, I expect, I hope that I open your eyes to a number of uh, key important concerns regarding Stonehenge and uh, the Neolithic across Britain because I believe that what I'm going to show you applies island-wide if not across the entire set of isles. Uh, so, um, so with that we'll get started here. I'm going to talk to you about Stonehenge, the, the monument of Stonehenge itself and also its, its greater landscape particularly centered on the greater Cursus which based on my research appears to be the key monument for the landscape. Stonehenge is very important, but it is a, a very important aside to what is going on with the cursus, thus the reason for the size of the cursus, as you'll see. Uh, just, uh, just a brief aside on Gobekli Tepe, which is going back 6,000 years before the cursus is, is constructed, 7,000 years before the megaliths go in at Stonehenge, uh, here, here we have uh, a megalithic pillar uh, with some symbolism that, that I discussed in a paper about four years ago that uh, Graham Hancock has picked up and discusses in his current book. But uh, the reason why I got started on Stonehenge in, in the first place is looking at circular symbolism. And here are these temples at Go Gobekli Tepe. And they're circular, subcircular. The, the, we have the same symbolism, essential symbolism, going on at Gobekli Tepe as we do at Stonehenge. And virtually every circular sacred symbol, medicine wheels and on and on, are all related to the same fundamental concepts, the same relationships of you and me, us and the earth, us and the cosmos, and us and the creator. Those four sacred relationships. Every circular symbol is representing the sphere, and that's a key point, and that's what I discuss in my first book, The, the Sacred Sphere. Uh, but you see it being expressed uh, you know, 10, 11, 12,000 years ago further back than that, in, in fact, in, in sacred symbolism. You see it at Gobekli Tepe, you, you're about to, to see it again at Stonehenge. So here's Stonehenge, photograph I took just a, a, a few years ago. Everyone knows that it's, a, it's uh, a, a circular henge, a bank and ditch, and within that you have a series of circles com comprised of um, s uh, megalithic structures and holes that used to have uh, timbers used to have uh, megaliths in them and so forth. But this circle and the series of concentric circles are representing uh, spheres, this, this idea of being centered in your heart, centered in your mind, center of the earth, center of the universe, uh, and at all directions, you are a part of the universe, the universe is a part of you. This is a universal understanding expressed by spheres, and we can't build spheres on the, on the surface of the earth, but we can draw circles, we can construct circular uh, structures, we can build pyramids that are representing the hemisphere, and you're probably all familiar with that. So, I'm also going to get in at the end of my talk on, on an, another important um, um, megalithic structure, a site goes, that goes back to the mid-Neolithic and it's a site that uh, is, is probably important to many of you that you have visited, <coughs> certainly important to Peter, and, I s and uh, so I want to bring it up because it has a key role to play in understanding what's going on in the, mi uh, the mid-Neolithic across Britain at Stonehenge and as it turns out at Avebury as well. Okay, you've probably heard these. Uh, Stonehenge is a cemetery and therefore it's about the dead. We find ashes and we find bones, so the archaeologists tell us it's all about the dead. Uh, and the Greater Cursus was a procession way. Everybody hear that? Has everybody heard of that? That's what it was for? 
Uh, Stonehenge Avenue was the easiest route between the River Avon and Stonehenge and built to align with paraglacial features of the underlying soil and chalk. People have heard about that? Okay, in Stonehenge, the ritual landscape of Stonehenge is prehistoric and we don't have any written evidence and therefore we can't know what the builders were all thinking. Uh, standard understanding in science. They're all wrong. <laughs> They're all wrong. There's no evidence that the cursus was ever a procession way. The cursus, like, uh, like hinge structures, circular banks and ditches, they, they are sacred structures. They are not structures, they weren't originally constructed for you and me to be entering them. Stonehenge was not built for us to go into the center and watch the, so the solstice sunrise. If we did that, we'd be interfering with what was going on there, what was intended, okay? The greater cursus, same thing. There's no evidence of it being used for anything. There, we have no idea. The archaeologists haven't got, got a clue. Their best guess is that it was a procession way. But in the media, you'll read that that's what it was, so hey, that's what it was, right? There's no evidence for it whatsoever, okay? There's no evidence for each one of these items. But that's the common understanding based on what's presented in the media. This is a diagram uh, prepared for a book that came out in 1965 uh, by uh, uh, an astronomer. And he, show, he identified a number of uh, alignments associated with Stonehenge, and this is just a few of them. Pay attention to the, the blue rectangle. The four corners of that rectangle are the, where the four station stones are located at Stonehenge, okay? That rectangle is not a rectangle. It's a quadrilateral, but the two, the two uh, long sides and the two short sides are not parallel. Uh, this is not a 90-degree angle. None of these are 90-degree angles, okay? Not even close. But I want you to pay attention to the size of this rectangle. This is what was published, and this is what was used to tell you what these various m solar and lo lunar alignments were for. Now, there are solar and lunar alignments there. But this is what, this is the basis for what was, you were being told. <coughs> this is what the station uh, stone quadrilateral actually looks like. And you can see on the bottom here, we've got a problem because these alignments are not aligning the way we're being told, okay? If this book is correct, then what's drawn at Stonehenge and is actually there can't be there. <coughs> because this is actually what is constructed. If this is what's actually constructed, then this has to be wrong. But this is what you've been told for four decades. Uh, definition of archaeology, the study of human history and prehistory through excavation of sites and analysis of artifacts and other physical remains. I've done my homework. I've read hundreds and hundreds of archaeological reports and other scientific reports regarding Stonehenge and many other sacred sites, okay? So I've got, got my homework there. That was the basis for my study, is starting with the, with the archaeology. But if we're going to understand these sites, you need more than archaeology. And that means not listening to the, the media reports about what the archaeologists say is going to change everything because we found a series of of megaliths that are laying down between Durrington Walls and Woodhenge, and this is going to change everything. Because they haven't seen any of the stones. They've done the geophysical work. They've, there's an indication that they're there. But they don't know why they're there, <laughs> what they were used for. But it's going to change everything, right? It changes nothing until they, they get some additional information, OK? What we need is archaeology, astronomy, anthropology, cultural studies, understanding sacred symbolism. And that's what I've been studying, studying for many, many years. And I'm bringing to the table here a holistic approach across the board, understanding the sciences, the both hard and soft sciences, to bring to you what I'm discovering regarding Stonehenge, which in, in a way does not counter what everyone's understanding is, but really broadens our understanding, and I think to a, to a sig very significant degree, as you're going to see. Okay, Stonehenge, the solar... Uh, alignment. We're all familiar with that, and I'm not going to get into that. The sun is rising uh, at the, at the uh, horizon, 
and passes through the, the heel stone into the center of Stonehenge where this photograph was, uh, where I took this photograph during a, a tour a few <laughs> years ago. So we all, we all know that. Uh, but what is more interesting, what, what's, what's going on, and my concern was that there's got to be more to Stonehenge in the construction, given that it's representing a sphere, more so than what's going on on the horizon, okay? There's something else going on there. We've got to be looking up. And in this case, this is a view looking to the southwest, and we see the moon uh, during the evening. More to the point, what we're going to be looking at a little bit later are the four station stones that I brought up later. But this is, this is one of the two remaining station stones. The other two are long gone. So we'll start the story uh, north of Scotland in the Orkneys. This is on, the, on mainland Orkney. And this is the uh, village, apartment village, a series of flats uh, on this island uh, of Scarab, and, and this is Scarabray. <coughs> A series of stacked stone walls creating a number of apartments that were separated by underground walkways. And this is one of, this is apartment nine, an example of, uh, this is typical of what was encountered and everyone was living underground here doing something, uh, we're not sure what, but I'm about to propose to you what they were involved in and you could see the, the bay uh, next, to, next to the town site there, they're right next to the open waters. Above the bed in one of these, in one of these, are we going to go back? We're not going to go back. Above uh, the bedstead of one of these uh, apartments, on one of the stones, the dry stack stones, was four, were four symbols. And no one has understood what the writing is. I mean, wh what are they saying? This is the first evidence, earliest evidence of any writing in the British Isles. No one can figure out what it's saying. It's not writing. It's a representation of the Milky Way. Um, this, is, this is exactly the way the writing looks. And when you put the Milky Way straight through on a, on a map, on a star map, you have Orion with his arm reaching up and down, this, you know, the sword of Orion or the spear of Orion. Okay. This is the star Capella. We have a series of three stars here forming a, tri a very prominent triangle over here. And here's a spring-like feature, seven, seven parts of the spring coming up and around. That's what these four symbols are representing, which is surprising because now we're going back 5,000 years ago and people have suggested that there was a, a, a marketing route, a, a trade route up and down the, the Atlantic seaboard, uh, but there's no evidence for it. And I propose this is evidence for it because these stars, this is the South Pole or the South Celestial Pole. You can't see these stars up in Scotland. You have to go down to the, the Horn of Africa to be able to see them. So either these people sailed down there and knew them and plotted it out along the Milky Way, or someone told them about it. Okay. So I say we do have evidence that there was a lot of travel, a lot of uh, uh, communication, transportation going on five, 6,000 years ago into this area. This is a close-up. Here we have Orion. His belt is right in here. This is the star Sirius, and uh, this is the star Capella. And we're really going to feature this area in the talk. This is the important, and notice that that was the center of, of the Milky Way as they had drawn it up. Can I go back? I can't. But well, there was a figure of, of Stonehenge there, and, and, and the sky. The sky is the prominent thing here. Here we are at Kingborough Ridge and uh, looking down at Stonehenge, and the suggestion has been that Stonehenge is at a very prominent ge uh, topographic location on Salisbury Plain. That's why it's located where it is. Well, it doesn't look very prominent to me. It's above Stonehenge Bottom. It's up somewhat on top of the flats here. But it, is, it really isn't a prominent location. There's something more going on as to why it's situated where it is. So here's a map, Google map, a uh, photograph of, of the area of concern, Stonehenge in the middle. You can, if you look close, you can see the, the cursus is coming through here, 1.7 miles long, about a football field, football field and a half wide. And then there's a number of monuments, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of monuments that have been found on the ground surface, evidence for that, or the geophysics underground. 
But of the hundreds and hundreds of them, there are only about two dozen that date back to the Middle Neolithic. In other words, about 3500 BC. The stones at Stonehenge going in a thousand years later, 2500 BC. So I'm going to talk to you about the Mid Neolithic, when the Cursus and, and about um, 1617 long barrows go in, before any of the round barrows. And then there are a number of known sacred sites on, the, on, the, on Salisbury Plain that go back many thousands of years that were important. So if we strip away all of the Bronze Age stuff that's going on, we're down to about two dozen sites that we know of that are of any importance um, to the landscape. So here's a map that I put together and it shows st Stonehenge. This is the avenue, right? Com it's coming down to the river and we've got the, uh, the Cursus. Here's the, the lesser Cursus. Um, the major issue here is the, the greater Cursus, which I propose is the center of the, and, and perhaps the most important monument that's out there. A lot of these others are the, the Bronze Age barrows going in. So we can ignore those if we're looking at the mid Neolithic. Here's a view, uh, uh, aerial view, looking down on the Cursus. We're looking to the east. The west end of the Cursus, looking to the east. Stonehenge is sitting right in here to orient you, so you all pretty well know where, what the view is. Uh, presuming that you've been, been out that way, you understand the perspective. Okay, the Cursus, the heel stone at Stonehenge, and these two lines, which are toward, from the heel stone towards summer solstice sunrise and summer solstice sunset, and these two pits that were discovered by archeologists in 2011. The suggestion being, they're on these alignments, but the suggestion best guess by the archeologists is you start here and you start processing with the dead body up to this line and you make a turn, you go over to Stonehenge and you do your rituals and ceremonies and you bury the ashes or bury the bones and so forth. Again, no evidence for it. But this changes everything. We've got two pits that are on these lines, and that means there must have been a procession going along here. It might have been going on. There's no evidence for it. That's the best guess, okay? In the early 1990s, an archaeologist who you may have heard of, you may have met, Terence Meaden. Heard of Terence Meaden? He discovered that there are nine long barrels that are oriented with their long axis pointing to one end or the other of the greater cursus. Each of these nine are pointed to one end or the other. So suddenly there are alignments beyond Stonehenge, there are alignments between older, uh, a thousand year older monuments. There's something going on here. So the idea was if we sight through a, a long barrel through the end of the cursus and up to the, to the horizon, there's something going on there. So the archaeologists started uh, cranking on their, their astronomical programs, trying to figure out what stars back 5,500 years ago were along these alignments. And they couldn't make any sense of it, because in some cases there are s important stars that come up, there are other alignments, there's nothing that's coming up of any importance. No stars, not the sun, not the moon, and so forth. But, so they're at a total loss. And when you leave here, you will not be at a total loss. So here are these nine alignments that Terence was discovering. What I realized, and my background originally was civil engineering, surveying, soil engineering. I later moved into geology, and I've conducted thousands of site investigations of the, the impact, the cultural impacts to properties. Okay, so that's what my background is, and ultimately I got into sacred symbolism, and, and here I am today. So. so we have these nine alignments. What I realized was this could be representing what you will see today at any engineered construction site where you're setting control points here, here, maybe in these are control points. But if we take this one as a control point and we want to set out a point for a building corner or a, or a baseline for construction, you set out a point, then you turn an angle and you set out your next point at a known distance. And what that means is that each of these long barrows is now related spatially, geometrically, to the other. And that's what I started with. Suppose these are not alignments, but these are angles. These are triangles relating each long barrow to the other, suggesting there's a map, there's a plan that, that, that is going on. Okay. Here are alignments that one can see from each of these sites. Not all of them, but... Uh, I've picked a few sites and shown that there are many alignments 
that can be made from any one of these points, which is an interesting thing because you could go to many locations on the, on the landscape and you have virtually no, no sighting of any of these sites. But these sites seem to be chosen such that you can see a number of the other ones to connect in with, they interconnect. The top of Lark Hill, tops of hills are our sacred sites, right? They still are, but they were important to, to, to human beings around the world throughout time. The top of Lark Hill has a long barrel, night and barrel. And it c you, from that you can see this long barrel and you can see the top of what I call Hill 134, which is actually along the alignment of the summer solstice sunrise coming through from Stonehenge. But you can see those points, but you can triangulate these points now and relate them one to another. And if you do that, you can start taking those points and start triangulating down and come down to the, uh, the greater cursus. And each of these points can see both ends of the cursus. They're at particular locations, so you can see important other points on the landscape. This is a map of these about two dozen mid-Neolithic uh, uh, physiographic sites and the monument sites, and these are naked eye alignments. You, can, you could stand at any one of these and see all these other alignments in this spider web. This is Beacon Hill here. From there, you can see almost every one of them from the east. Okay, so these are naked eye alignments, which is very, un very strange because, like I say, most locations, you wouldn't be able to have this many alignments, <coughs> but these locations are set so that you can do that. So there's a plan that's apparent going on here. If we start removing alignments and start looking at what's fundamental to the, to the core of the landscape, the core being between the west end and the east end of the, of the cursus, we start to pick out some things. We continue with a bilateral symmetry, which you wouldn't expect if these are just, if you rolled a dozen dice across the landscape and let them fall where they may, you're not, a, you're not gonna be expecting this type of symmetry going on here. You're also not going to expect that you're gonna have a perfectly due east-west line. You're not gonna have a, a point going from one long barrel to this corner of the greater cursus to this, uh, you know how the, the, the cursus gets wider and then it starts narrowing again. There's this little kink, this little uh, uh, pivot point. Through that point and then over to another long barrel and over to a tor sitting back over here, a, a megalithic tor sitting over here. Perfect alignment through there, over, over two miles long, but they laid that in as a, as a baseline and became part of the cursus, okay? So we have north-south baselines, east-west baselines, the, the formation of lines through both uh, south and north ends of the cursus coming out, very accurately placed, and then you have these other monuments that are being placed such that they can see both ends of the cursus. If we st continue to cut down the number of alignments to, g to get to the core of what's going on, what's really fundamental, wh what you end up is the, with these four points. And interestingly, you still have the bilateral symmetry. And you have uh, along this line here, okay? If you connect rather than into the uh, cursus, but look at the perimeter of what we've constructed, what we're ending up with, if we, if we call this a control point for constructing whatever it was, and this control point, which was a megalith, that was either in the river or along its bank and was moved in the last hundred years. So we don't know exactly the exact location. But it, but it looks like you know, where I've plotted it is basically where I'm being told where it used to be located, okay, along that line. Um, so these are control points for this structure in here, which is a hexagon. And I believe that's why these structures are being built on chalk land. They're very large. They're not built so that you can stand two kilometers away and see them, because in many spots of the of that you could be right over here and you're not gonna see any of it. But if you're 100 miles above the earth, you're gonna see it. That's why these are large structures, they're made in white chalk, they're made to be seen above. And the important thing is not for us to be able to see them, it's the symbolism that's being created as above, so below, and creating this pathway to and from the stars. Okay, Newgrange. People have been to Newgrange? Okay, some of you haven't been there, but you know about it, hopefully. Okay. Newgrange, about 400 kilometers to the northwest on a different island. Here's, here's Newgrange, it's a very large passage grave. If you can get up there and see it, it's magnificent. 
there's another uh, another passage grade to the northwest, and that's at the location of Nauf. This is the Nauf passage grade. And there's another one called Douth to the northeast. And they form a triangle. And this triangle, this leg of the triangle is oriented not due east-west, but from north, 84 degrees from north. Okay, so due east, go north six degrees. That's the same orientation as the greater Crisis. The greater Crisis does not point to equinox sun. It's pointing to the north of that, about six degrees. Same thing as this alignment. Okay, turns out this is the very same triangle, virtually the same size. And in fact, to, in the third dimension, the ground surfaces uh, uh, you know, from the top of these monuments creates the same angle. So you're looking up slightly, looking at the horizon, looking at in 3500 BC when these were constructed and the Cursus was constructed and the long girls were constructed. So you could see that crossing point in Capella rising straight above that so the, so the spirit could return back. Okay, And you is an unknown site. The archaeologists have done none, no work there. But I have been in contact with the lead archaeologist who's been studying this area all around it, but hasn't gone there. And there, the, the ground surface here is hummocky. It's been disturbed. Okay, it's hum got a hummocky surface. So I say there may be something there. And I suggested the archaeologist, he look at that. He look at that. He said in 18 months they'll have um, uh, monies available and they will put that into their plan to take a look at that site because. It overlooks a river, it's on a slope, it's undisturbed, it hasn't been looked at, and it's precisely where the equivalent woodhenge would be located that overlooks a river on a slope directly on line here. If that happens, we have a direct relationship between the two most important landscapes on the British Isles, directly, specifically, unrecognized. Okay, so here's the Stonehenge one, you just saw the Brunaboyne. Uh, New Grange one, and here are the two triangles. And this, the difference in this angle, for example, is, is about one degree. Here is the heel stone, here's the Stonehenge hinge, here's New Grange, it's a large structure, and it's within 281 feet of each other. This is 13,000, 14,000 feet. This is a huge triangle, but they were built virtually to the same size, same orientation, built at the same time. And it, that can't be coincidence. So back to Stonehenge and that landscape. Uh, this is a, an ancient city in Mexico, which is north of Mexico City. We have the Pyramid of the Moon, Pyramid of the Sun. Those are just modern names. We don't know what these were referred to. This is referred to as the Feathered Serpent pe Pyramid. The, serp the Feathered Serpent is represented by Orion. Okay? And we have the Avenue of the Dead. And we have a river that used to flow through here, and what they had, what these people had done is turned it into a canal straight through here. And that canal, effectively, if you put the scale together, runs right through where this intersection point is. So this avenue of the dead, is it the dead body or the dead spirit? It's the dead spirit, and they're creating a means looking this way, the orientation is correct, that they're looking at Capella and that intersection point along that avenue. And this, from here to here, would be the uh, Greater Cursus, and up at that point at the end of the road is right where Woodhenge to Capella would be located. So, Stonehenge isn't the only place this is built, and, and Bruna Point, uh, the New Greens. It's going on around the world at different times. People are, again, recognizing this as being the source of spirit. Uh, Lakota, native tribe. Uh, in, in the Americas that I, I know quite well and have talked to the elders. This is the winter hexagon, except that instead of Aldebaran, we have the Pleiades coming into play here. But here's that crossing point. We have the ecliptic coming through. We have the Milky Way coming through here. And the Milky Way between Sirius and Capella is Wanaji to Tanku, the path of the spirit, the ghost trail, the way to and from the earth and from where the source of spirit, source of life comes from. Pochoka the center or womb of the universe. Okay. Same ideas as the, as the uh, Egyptians, again, the Mayans, the Chinese. Uh, <coughs> Qian in China, there, there is a, a roadway, I can't remember the name of the, the road of the whoever. <coughs> uh, it, it, it's built to the same 
relative dimensions. It's representing the same spirit <coughs> for the ancient Chinese head. So again, Orion, we have the, the winter hexagon there. So that is what they were looking at a thousand years before the stones at Stonehenge goes in. So I want to quickly take a look at what was going on at Stonehenge in 2500 BC when all these other megaliths are going in, everybody's concentrating on that. You've got these two remaining lonely um, uh, station stones, two of the four are left there, and the thought by a prominent archaeologist was, well, these were important when they were putting these guys in. Once they, once they had them in, they didn't need them, they just left them there, and, it's not, you know, and they end up being a rectangle, which isn't a rectangle, but they don't know what they're for, but they're made, they may be solar and lunar alignments, but they're not because they're not accurate. Okay? So the question for me is, if they're not these alignments, then what are they? So there, there's the four locations. And there's the quadrilateral, it's not a rectangle, it's close, but it's not a rectangle. <clears throat> and I started looking at what's the orientation of that rectangle, the, the long axis of that rectangle. And here we have Stonehenge, the surface of the earth, and, and this dip slope, a dip from high to low, okay, a dip slope coming through that point. And as, as you're probably aware, throughout the course of the year, here's the equator, and it's oriented towards the sun in the summertime and away from the sun in the wintertime. And on the equinoxes, it's, we have a level surface here for the equator. So that's changing over, over time. Okay. So if we go back to this picture, here we have the equator, and it, it must be an equinox because it's flat through the earth here, and we've got Stonehenge sitting up here. But the orientation of that rectangle then of the station stones is going to change relative to the orientation of how the equator uh, relates to the cosmos over the course of the year. So that rectangle is going to move, and it actually moves at one, one degree a year. And the average orientation of these two long sides is about 139.3 degrees from due north. Okay, so it's pointing to the south. Right? And it changes about one degree every year. Celtic festivals. I want to key in on Lunasa. Begin, begins the end of July, beginning of August. This, again, this is the period of time when the Nile is flowing, and this is important down in Egypt. Contemporary, contemporaneous, same thing going on here. <clears throat> we have a two-week festival that you're more familiar with than I am but associated with the new king and the old king and the harvesting of the wheat, and you probably know the mythology and the stories and the festivals. Okay, so I'm not going to get into that. Um, but on August 2nd, when the festival starts, within a day, okay, the, on that date, all of Orion rises above the, above the horizon before the sun appears. This is the first date to see all of, horizon, uh, all of Orion, which is the result of the star Satan. Once safe appears, you can see it all of Orion. Two weeks later, here comes Sirius. So the first day that Sirius appears, and the first day that the entire winter hexagon can, can be seen, the source of light, okay, is two weeks later on August 15th. And the view, if you're, if you're in the center of Stonehenge, you've removed all the stones, the view would be between these two station stones, the short <laughs> length of that rectangle or quadrilateral. So the view is towards this very thing that was very important a thousand years ago, before that. Okay, so it seems to be coming into play again, and it involves Orion and the Winter Hexagon. So this is my summary, the first appearance of the sky god Orion in its entirety since summer solstice, and on August 15th is the first appearance of Sirius, which is Sirius also is representing the star Sirius as, as Isis. So it's, become, it's important for Isis and, and the mother of the universe, the mother of life here. And as soon as it appears after summer solstice, that whole doorway opens up for viewing Orion. Okay, who's the Celtic god Lu? The Proto-Indo-European -Indo language, the source of the Celtic language. Lugus represents shine or fiery. In Latin, it was changed to lux, which means light. Lu is the bringer of light. He's the fierce striker, according to the mythology. In Welsh mythology, he's the bright one with the strong hand. And who is that's Orion? Okay. Here we have Orion, and it, this is a view from uh, 2013, I think. It, it still applies today. It's virtually unchanged uh, for summer solstice. When you see that summer solstice sun rise above the horizon. 
underneath the horizon, you will have Orion with his hand reaching up, and he's going to carry the sun across the sky. And if you read uh, Egyptian mythology, that's exactly what Orion Osiris is doing. Okay. So even today, the same scenario is playing out with the, with the bringer of light. The bringer of light is not the sun. The bringer of light is Orion, brings the sun. Okay? Lu is the sky king, the bringer of light. He's the god of the spirit of light. He's receiving that source of the spirit and sending it forth to earth. Okay, so this is, this is the spirit. The physical life, manifest life, the source of that is the earth and this earth goddess. So we start to fall back into what we've all just had this feeling about Stonehenge and what's going on with the Celts. And I, it, I believe it's right. That, that part of the story is correct. What I've been describing to you before is all the background leading up to that. Uh, that justifies what the myth is all about. Okay? So we have the two. We have Orion, that source of spirit, and we have the earth, the source of the material. And on August 15th, when you have that complete doorway of Orion, because Sirius is appearing, you now have that doorway, and I believe that what was done, and the reason why the, the uh, station stone quadrilateral is sized the way it is and oriented that way, is because they, you can now rotate that source of light, that uh, bringer of light, the sun Lu down into the womb of the earth represented by Stonia. You have, you have the conception of light on June 21st with the cosmic energy entering into Stonehenge, right? Lunasa involves the, the death of the old king of light, the bringer of the new, and on August 15th, symbolically, we rotate that light into the womb of the earth for birth in the coming year to begin the process of life for the following year. So once we've done that, we now have Orion, we have Lu, we have the new king sitting there in the womb of the earth, which is what this sphere, what this circle is representing, which generally corresponds with what you know, we kind of think is going on there. Okay, So suddenly, yeah, it's all making sense astronomically, cosmographically, mythologically, and what we see on the ground architecturally. The story seems quite complete, and we have the bringing together of the two of them. And interestingly enough, these stars are plotting, if you rotate Orion around on these various alignments, these circles of stones, which may be coincidental, I'm not sure, but it sure seems fishy to me. Okay, now, when Orion goes, goes from the eastern horizon to the west, and as he's rotating around there, his whole body, the stars are, are aligning. Uh, and, and rotating around each other. So therefore, you can think of uh, Orion plotted in here, this whole thing rotating around. So if we rotate around and we take that star Betelgeuse, which is his right shoulder point, and we face it out towards, pointing out through to this is upside down, so south is up and north is down, so we have the summer solstice sunrise off in this direction. Okay, so we orient Orion this way. We have his arm, Betelgeuse, reaching up, and he's reaching up to this crossing point, okay? And he's reaching up to the Milky Way to receive that spirit or send that spirit forth. And we have the, the greater curse is sitting here reaching up to that crossing point. We take Orion within the, within the, earth, the womb of Mother Earth, and I'm going to rotate that figure. Pay attention to this figure. And we have Orion outlined here, reaching out along the ecliptic here. Uh, the avenue represents Orion's arm, and it plots extremely well for his arm reaching up to that crossing point. The remaining part of the avenue, it, it, after it bends quickly here, curves nice and gently through what would plot as the galactic anti-center and the second most important or brightest star of uh, the uh, constellation up here that's associated with Capella through those points and right down to the Bluestone Henge and right down to the river, which the archaeologists are saying the body is prepared up here, sailed down to this point, unloaded, brought up, brought up the avenue to Stonehenge, you run your rituals and you bury the body and that's the end of it. 
And I say that what apparently is going on here symbolically is I think that they may be right. You bring the body down to this point, you unload it, and you return the body back to the earth and to Orion, the source of life, as he's reaching up to receive it and into Stonehenge, where you're going to perform your rituals and you're going to bury the ashes and you're going to bury the body and take care of that and allow the spirit to move on to this point, looking for the crossing point in Capella, represented by Woodhenge, and waiting for that moment when the spirit can return back to where it came from. So I think that, again, part of the story, we have part of the story, but does that have anything to do with paraglacial features? It may be coincidental that they were noticing that when they were building the, the, the avenue, but this is the important thing. This is the symbolism that's going on in a gross scale. This is what they were envisioning. This is why they built this huge, uh, these huge monuments out here and relating one to the other is they're trying to incorporate this symbolism, which is universal and timeless around the world, it's laid out there on, on Salisbury Plain. Very plainly, it's, it's there. Uh, as, as a quick aside, you've heard about this wall that was built. Uh, a, a, there's a trench that's been found in the last few years, and the archaeologists say, well, this was a great big fence so that the common people could not see what was going on, the ceremonies going on at, at, at Stonehenge right there. They had to keep the people out. That doesn't make any sense, because if you're like me, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to watch from over here. <laughs> but it's a great big, it's got to be a great big fence, because the holes are, <coughs> like so you've got great big logs or timbers. Well, yeah, you could put in great big timbers, and you could cut them down at ground level, and you've got something that looks like that right along ground level. It doesn't have to be a tall fence. It could have been a tall fence, but it doesn't have to be. But their assumption is, well, it has to be a tall fence. What was going on in 2500 BC? It's the latter part of the Neolithic. There's agriculture going on. There are scythes around. And if we rotate that scythe, we can put it right next to Orion, who's representing that source of life, and the old king and the new king, and the slicing off the head of the old king and returning him back to the stars and receiving the new king. And it's the story of Lunasa. Okay. So I would propose that's a more likely reason for this structure going in rather than a fence to keep you and me out. So I would build a fence all the way around. I, that's, uh, that is so silly. I can't believe they put that out in the media for people to eat up. Okay. So I think that's what's going on, a proto-Lunasa. And what the Celts in their mythology are describing is something that goes back 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 years before that, there was this, this understanding. And it's all played out in Celtic mythology as part of the evolution of understanding of what was going on. Okay, lastly, I want to talk about something that's uh, dear to uh, many people, including myself now, and then that's the West Kent of Long Barrel. Here's the view from the inside. You're in back uh, deep inside the, the Long Barrel, and you're looking back to the east. Here, same perspective, but up on top, looking to the east, and a space facing towards the summer, the, the solar equinox. Oops, no it's not. It's pointing six degrees north of the equinox. It's not pointing east-west. And have you seen that orientation before? It's the same as the Greater Cursus. Okay? Built at the same time as these other long barrels, the Greater Cursus. And it's a linear feature, and it's pointing slightly up, like the Greater Cursus does. Okay? And in 3500 BC, he was looking at this structure, the womb of the, co the, the womb of the cosmos. Okay, the source of spirit. And there's Orion sitting there. He was looking at that. He was looking at the winter hexagon. He was looking at the same thing that the greater cursus does. And so you can envision this being a greater cursus. So here we're looking back more to the west. Uh, so the, the front end, looking through, is, is right here. So east would be off in this direction. <laughs> But this is what the spirits of the bones of the bodies that were placed into the long girl were looking at. They're looking at returning back to where they came from. I believe that the spirit of the people that were laid in West Kent and Long Barrow and all Long Barrows are looking forward to that journey back to where they came from. And this structure is oriented 
very prominently, it's very large, it's an important structure on the Avery landscape, and I believe it's representing the same thing that the Cursus is representing. That means to go to the netherworld world back and forth. Which is kind of in line with what we're kind of thinking about, you know, being able to look to the east and, and uh, back to the cosmos, or back to the sun, the father, but it's not the sun, it's, it's astronomical, it's this womb of the cosmos, it's Auriga, it's Capella, and it's waiting for this alignment to happen down, down the corridor, and when you see that, you're headed home. So there's the alignment there looking from the top of, of West Kent of Longarrow. Yes, West Kent of Longarrow is an archetypal mid-Neolithic Longarrow, it's representing all other Longarrows, even though they may be oriented in different directions, uh, there may be particular reasons for that, but they're all built for this for this purpose. It's rep it represents the spirit path. It is manifest as a spirit path between the earth and the womb of the universe. Okay, Long Barrows and Stonehenge cur curses symbolize the Milky Way as the spirit path of Sirius to Capella, the pathway the spirit begins in the long run. And lastly, I show uh, the Adam's Grave Long Barrow which is a magnificent sight because if you're up on top of it, you've got the veil below, but you've got the sky here in 3500 BC and before you, oriented, looking to the southeast and waiting for that very same moment to, to occur. And you can see the very same thing happen. Um, well, it'll happen at about 4 o'clock this morning if you look to the southeast. You'll see this very same event and the, the winter hexagon there before you. Because it's just after Lunasa, we're a month, a month and a half after that, but the sky is still showing this, this very same thing there. So you can see that. So if you go here, if you go to West Kent and Long Barrow, and go to the latter part of the summer, and stand there and look to the east, you'll see, you'll see this now. That's where the spirit goes to and from, according to world mythology, the cultures of people around the world throughout time. That's the source. Thank you very much.